All right, let's continue with what Revelation teaches. And in Revelation, we're going to look at uh, basically three different passages. So we're going to look at the fifth seal of the martyr saints in heaven. Uh, that's found in Revelation 6, the great multitude that's before the throne in Revelation 7, and then the harvesting of the earth by two angels, one to reap what is ripe in Revelation 14, starting verse 14, and one to harvest the grapes for the great winepress of the wrath of God, which is also Revelation 14, starting in verse uh, 17. So, the fifth seal. Revelation 6, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, now that's a strange place, the souls, that's an interesting word, of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge the blood on those who dwell on earth? And then they were what? Each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. Why? Until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. Well, what does that mean? Who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So this is very, very clear uh, telling us uh, that the fifth seal is martyrs coming out of the tribulation and not only are martyrs coming out but the God's intention is that many more will come out as martyrs standing up for what's right and being killed for their testimony uh, and their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ a very strong sobering teaching of God refining um, his church um, the saints and um, what we'll read later, um, the Jewish people. So what about chapter 7? And now we got this great multitude before the throne. And so uh, John says, after this, I look and behold, there was a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb and clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Of uh, Just a magnificent event that's going on that uh, many theologians goes ah that's the rapture that's the rapture so let's look at this a little deeper uh going on still the then one of the elders you know these elders that are always in the know address me saying um who are these clothed in white robes john and from where have they been where have they come well john knew he was being set up so he said to them sir you know and he said to me these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So what he did not say here was these are the ones that we yanked up out of the great tribulation. He says they're coming out. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, it is plausible that... Uh, um, uh, this coming out of the Great Tribulation occurs after the six seal cosmic events uh, that we saw the, the sun, moon, and stars going dark, which would then support Jesus' teaching that the rapture occurs, what? After this, which is in Revelation 6. Uh, the bigger question, though, is whether coming out of, what does that mean? Does it, does it mean more martyrs, like what we read in the fifth seal, that we got to have more martyrs, many more martyrs, so just rest until we get that number? Or is this the resurrection? Or is this the rapture? Uh, or is it all the above? Uh, when we look at the verb coming here, uh, erkamai, that is used in the present and imperfect tense, which is telling us that it's a past action, 
but it's still in progress. It has not been completed at the time in question. So this tells us that the coming out of the Great Tribulation is what? It's still ongoing. It's still in progress. Uh, and then we read on. Therefore they are before the throne of God, all these multitudes, and to serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. So he is there. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike on them, nor any scorching heat. Uh, so they won't hunger, they won't thirst. Why? Because they didn't take the mark of the beast. You know, they had to take the mark of the beast to eat their food, to have water, to, to be clothed, to be housed. Uh, the sun shall not strike, uh, strike them, nor the, any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne, that tells us the lamb is still there in the midst of the throne. He has not left the throne room, will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay, now this is, uh, shall we say, the, the centerpiece of the pre-wrath rapture theory. So just as a review, the pre-wrath puts what? The rapture after the three and a half year midpoint of Daniel 77, when the great tribulation is cut short by Jesus in order to save God's elect, which tells us God's elect's on the ground. Uh, they also say that four events must occur before the rapture. The return of Elijah, the prophet, as foretold in Malachi 4.5. The great falling away of man. The, the, the great apostasy. The, the revealing of the Antichrist. As well as what? The cosmic event of the sun, moon, and stars going dark. Um, that was foretold all over the Old Testament uh, and New Testament. And then they say the saints will be raptured into heaven. Okay? Not meeting Christ in the air and continuing on with whatever Christ is, maybe the Revelation 19 charge, but meeting Christ in the air and then Christ is going to escort them into heaven. And we'll spend some time with Jesus before God's wrath is poured out on the earth. Uh, and as we said, this is the most common position of the early church. Okay, so now let's compare and analyze these. All right? So, in support of the pre-wrath rapture, okay, and we just went over what those details are, uh, we note that there are significant differences between those arriving in heaven during the fifth seal, or are we even saying they're arriving in heaven, and those in the seventh, uh, chapter seven, between the sixth and the seventh seal. So remember the sixth seal is the sun, moon, and stars. The seventh seal is the the psalm event that starts the seven trumpets. Okay, the fifth seal are those who what? Who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they have borne. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, they're martyrs, but we're also told there's going to be many, many, many more martyrs. Chapter 7, well, the saints here are the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. So what does that mean? There's no mention of them being slain as martyrs, so that would be in favor of possibly the rapture, only that they shall hunger no more or, or neither thirst anymore. Hmm, okay. The fifth seal, we're told, uh, the, the saints there were told to what? To rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers should be complete who would be killed as they themselves have been. So the number was incomplete. While the chapter 7 saints are already a great multitude that no one could number. Okay, uh, they're making a pretty good argument here. Uh, the fifth seal of martyrs are descri described as what? Souls. Huh, interesting choice of word. And where are they? They're under the altar. Uh, and this may indicate that uh, maybe they don't have physical bodies yet. And they were given white robes, and they were told what? Something very strange. They were told to rest a little longer. So it's like, go back to sleep. Uh, the chapter 7 saints, they're standing around the throne. They're clothed in white robes, and they have palm branches where? 
in their hands. You have to have a hand to hold a palm branch. So this indicates that they have physical bodies. And the only way that can happen, well, Paul explained that already very succinctly, is they have to have redeemed bodies that the perishable must put on the imperishable and the mortal had to put on immortality. And that only happens at either the resurrection, the first resurrection, or the rapture. Okay, let's read on. The fifth seal martyrs, they cried out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? They are frustrated, and they want God to avenge their deaths. While the chapter 7 saints are what? They're rejoicing. They're worshiping God. They're crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb and all the angels standing around the throne and all the elders uh, and, and the four living creatures are saying what? Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So this is just a, a, an incredible praise and worship and rejoicing event, um, quite different from the fifth seal martyrs. So, the pre-wrath, so all that is pretty much in favor of what uh, the pre raphers believe in. Uh, they also say that four events must occur before the rapture. Okay, uh, we'll take them kind of backwards. The cosmic events, sun, moon, and stars, that was in Revelation 6. The revealing of the Antichrist, that is already, uh, in fact, that started out in seal number 1. Uh, uh, but has has been ongoing, especially uh, seal uh, two, um, and then also there's the great falling away of man. Well, we've already been seeing a lot of that, and then there's the return of Elijah the prophet. Well, how does that fit in? And so, what is the prophecy? First, the prophecy is Malachi four five. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day. Of the Lord comes. So obviously this prophecy was made hundreds of years after Elijah was on earth and was taken up into heaven. So what does the New Testament say here? Luke 1 13, but the angel said to him, uh, that being Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will shall, shall call his name John. And he will turn many to the children of Israel, to the Lord their God. And he will go before him, him being the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So is this uh, the return of Elijah being fulfilled? Maybe. Maybe. It does not say thus was fulfilled by the prophet uh, 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 Micah, but it's still a very strong passage. Uh, Revelation 11.3, we have what? The two witnesses, and they will prophesy for what? Three and a half years, 1260 days, and they're clothed in sackcloth. They're in Jerusalem. They're a thorn in the side of the Antichrist. In verse 6, it says they have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now the latter, that was the power that was given to Moses. But the former, the power to shut the sky to stop any rainfall? Well, let's read what was given to Elijah. 1 Kings 17, 1, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Wow. Powerful. And what we're seeing here in uh the prophet and the witness, or the two witnesses, yes, we're seeing that power too. The power of uh, Moses and the power of Elijah. So we can say that uh, in either one of the passages, um, definitely the latter, uh, that that has been fulfilled. So what's my takeaway in all this? 
it's very, very strong argument. There is merit to the comparison of the fifth seal in Revelation 6. We're under the altar. We are seeing souls who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they have borne, uh, being told to rest longer until what the number to be killed uh, has, uh, like them, has uh, been elevated. Uh, compared to the chapter 7 saints who are standing around the throne. They're clothed in white robes. they got palm branches in their hands indicating that they have physical bodies. And that's the only way uh, they can have that is if it's a resurrected, glorified body. So could this, in chapter 7, be the resurrected and raptured saints? Uh, that would mean that uh, there's nobody else left on the ground. So, maybe, maybe not. There's three things in Revelation 7 in the great multitude that really needs to be reconciled here. In verse 13 and 14, uh, when, the, when one of the 24 elders asked John, uh, who are these? And he gave the specific answer, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. So that's not clearly telling us exactly how they came out, other than it is an ongoing process of coming out of the great tribulation. Um, it's not telling us it's a rapture. It's not telling us it's a resurrection gathering. Or is it? You know, we have to look at both sides of this. Uh, it, and we have to ask the question, okay, is the rapture and resurrection all at once? So everybody at once is out, 100% of those uh, that um, have, have perished in the past, or 100% of those that are still on the ground, or does it occur in an ongoing, almost like a wave, uh, where, where uh, people start getting to be resurrected, and more people start getting to get raptured, and it continues almost like in a stream uh, on a timeline. Well, it doesn't really tell us, but I would lean towards everybody coming up at once. Verse 17, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. So because he's in the midst of the throne, tells us Jesus has not departed the throne of heaven, which would be his second coming, the parousia. Uh, uh, now that's assuming that the resurrect resurrection and rapture and the second coming are one in the same event. Now remember, like the pre-trib crowd, they don't believe that. They believe really fundamentally that there's two events. Jesus come down to, to rapture the saints uh, and resurrect the saints, and then he comes back up to heaven, then he comes down again with Armageddon. Uh, but the Bible is not really clear on this. Also in verse 17, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Um, it does not eliminate that these are martyred uh, saints. They could still be martyred saints like those in the fifth seal. It's just now the fullness of number is there because what? They're still carrying the knowledge and frustration in spite of all their praise and worship of, of the evil injustice that resulted in their death. And God is there wiping away their tears from their eyes as opposed to a universal uh, elation of being raptured out of the great tribulation you know, victory! We're, we're, we've been taken out! Um, <coughs> we're just not told that. So, <clears throat> that's the fifth seal and, and the chapter 7 event. Now let's look at Revelation 14. Because this is also very interesting. <clears throat> the harvesting of the earth by two angels. 1414. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man. Now, it doesn't say it is a son of man, but like a son of man, that's also in chapter 1 in Revelation, who was, by the way, Jesus Christ, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. And so he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Very possible. This is a resurrection and a rapture. 
Not all theologians believe that. Some believe that it's still the wrath of God. And then there's others, probably a growing number, that believe that this is uh, the resurrection and the rapture. And when we compare this reaping to Mark, uh, Jesus' teaching in Mark 4, where Jesus says the kingdom of God. Now, what is exactly the kingdom of God? Well, it's those who enter into God's kingdom, right? At the, at the end of age. That is the kingdom of God. It is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises at night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself. First the blade and then the ear and then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, so when the crop is ready uh, to be harvested or uh, in the words here, the earth is fully ripe in Revelation. At once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, one thing we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt in Revelation 14 and this passage is that the harvest has come. The question is, is it the harvest of the righteous or the harvest of the unrighteous? Well, Revelation 14 continues, and it says, Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven. He too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. Now, which fire is this? Is, the, is this the fire of the altar, or is this the fire like the lake of the fire? Probably the altar. But nevertheless, he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth, gathered the grape harvest of the earth. He threw it, he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Not good. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. So that is the other harvest of the unrighteous. So what can we conclude from this passage? Well, first and foremost, Revelation 14 through 14 through 16 could be the gathering, the harvesting of the saints. Uh, the, it, it really corresponds with the Mark account we read. So this gathering harvesting, which would be the resurrection and the rapture, and after a complete harvest, there's nobody left that is ripe for the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So that leaves what? The remainder, which is verses 17 through 20, which happens immediately after the first harvesting of the righteous. This gives a clear picture of the coming uh, outpouring of God's wrath that will occur on the day of the Lord. Uh, so Revelation 14 through 20, the whole passage here, it compares favorably to what Jesus taught in the Olivet Discourse of after the tribulation. He will send out his angels and gather his elect and the righteous will be taken to heaven before the throne and before the Lamb while the unrighteous are what? They are left and will face the full wrath of God, which will be poured out in his bowls of wrath. So, I want to look at a couple more areas. One is, let's look at the, at the rapture and resurrection, looking through the lens of the Passover, because we have said all along, the Passover is so fundamental and so important to understanding Revelation and the end times. So, uh, we'll look at that. And Jesus taught about a future fulfillment and celebration of the Passover. Where? In the kingdom of God. In fact, at the Lord's Supper, which was the Passover Supper, uh, he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Okay, that's very, very important. And one thing we should notice in Revelation, Jesus is referred to what? As the Lamb. 30 times in Revelation, the Lamb. 
Well, what about the lion of the tribe of Judah? Yes, one time. He was referred to as a lion, uh, and, and that was in chapter 5. So, why is Jesus overwhelmingly referred to as a lamb? I think that's a very important and relevant question. It's not trivial. And in fact, it just may unlock a very important truth to our understanding of end times. What we're being told is the answer is found in the Passover. So let's look at the Passover. Exodus 12, verse 3. Um, this is going to be kind of like a Reader's Digest condensed version, but uh, God says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. So each household had a lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male one year old. You shall keep it. And actually, it'll be for three days until the 14th day of this month. Then when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs all at once at twilight. And then they shall take some of the blood and they will put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. It's the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to, dest to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Verse 24, you shall then, then he says, you shall observe this right, being the Passover is a statute for you and for your sons forever. Whoa. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses, and the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Okay, so let's dissect this. First and foremost, remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus Christ, where he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Such a powerful prophetic statement. So the Passover message is that God delivered his children out of Egypt. How? Through the blood of the Lamb. The gospel message of redemption is what? God sent his Son, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, as the perfect Lamb to earth to deliver his children through his blood from what? from the evil one that rules the world. So just as God delivered the children of Israel, the Jews out of Egypt in Exodus, he will once again deliver them. This time, it will be a, just a Jewish remnant, um, Jacob's trouble, and then of course also uh, all the Christians, uh, out from the Egypt of this fallen world to be his people. That is the new covenant, okay? That is the redemption side of Jacob's trouble, which we have gone over in past. So Egypt is a type and foreshadow, all right, in all this. Pharaoh, he was what? He was considered in Egypt as deity. That's a type and a foreshadow of Satan. Satan is described in the New Testament as what? The God, little g, of this world. And also the ruler of this world and then also the prince of this world pharaoh's rule dominated every aspect of egyptian culture just like satan today dominates and permeates every aspect of the world culture that we live in today first john uh, 5 explains we know that we are from god and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one Satan. So just as the Hebrews were slaves to Pharaoh, people today 
in the here and now. They are slaves to the prince of this world. How's that? Through drugs, through alcohol, sexual immorality, pornography, the love of money, sports, social status. It just goes on and on. Um, Paul explained in Ephesians 2, in which you were once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in who? The sons of disobedience. So, Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed, right? In Exodus 12, 1, they were instructed to tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect. They're to take care of them until the 14th day. So however you do your math, let's say three days later, um, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. That means every Jewish family was commanded to take care of and to slaughter, to kill this lamb and to collect his blood and to eat his flesh. The killing, the ceremony, there were no priests there. There was no other officials there. This was done by each and every household. The whole family witnessed and participated in the slaughter of their lambs. This is very, very relevant and important because everyone was a participant in the death of the Passover lamb. Guess what? Everyone was a participant in the death of the lamb of God. Now you say, how, how was that? Uh, wasn't it the Romans and Jews that killed Jesus? No, it was more than that. It was all of us that crucified the Lamb of God on the execution stake, the cross. And you would say, how? By the sinful nature within us. Why did he die? It was our sin that put him on the cross 2,000 years ago. This shared killing and death by each and every one of us was necessary because it resulted in atonement for all who accept Jesus. Very, very powerful. <clears throat> so in Exodus, it was the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of the individual homes that received the mercy and blessing of the Lord. The spiritual condition, the maturity of whoever was inside, the inhabitants, that was not considered. Only the blood of the Lamb. Today, it's the blood of the Lamb that redeems us. Our spiritual condition and maturity is not considered. We cannot earn our way into salvation when it comes to salvation. Only the blood of the Lamb of God is what saves us. First Peter 1.13 says, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. How? With the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or without spot. So, <clears throat> let's go back to Revelation 9, verse 1, where the fifth angel was blowing his trumpet, and they were told what? Not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but who? Only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So just like in the days of Exodus, it was the blood of the Lamb. It was that spiritual marker uh, that um, protected the end-time believers from God's judgment. Well, guess what? In Revelation 9, this passage, it infers that believers in Jesus Christ will actually be around during the tribulation. So you had the 144,000 that had not accepted Christ yet as their Messiah, and then you also had uh, the, the saints. And were they really around during then? Well, read Revelation 12, 17, that the dragon became furious after he was thrown down the earth with his angels, with the women, woman, which, which was Israel, and the Jewish people. And he went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus that, my friend, is Christians 
Jew or Gentile, it makes no difference. If they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're Christians, part of the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, some things to consider here. The exodus of Israel out of Egypt, we can see that as a prototype of the church as well as the remnant Jews in Jacob's trouble. Remember, we got two, two streams of people that are being ad addressed by God. The children of Israel, they were protected from God's plagues, right? Because where were the children of Israel during all these plagues? They were in Egypt. They were in Goshen. And we were told that while everything was going down against Pharaoh and the Egyptians, they were shielded from whatever the plague was. Uh, many of the plagues in Exodus are very similar or even identical to God's judgments in Revelation. Do you think that is a coincidence? Hmm. Or by chance uh, that just such similarities exist? I don't think so. Maybe, just maybe, God is trying to tell us something. And that something, uh, that mystery is revealed in the Passover. So when did God take all the children of Israel out of Egypt? Good question. It was after all the plagues, every one against Pharaoh and Egypt had occurred. Okay? And we're seeing plagues ongoing and, and, and uh, breaking of seals and blowing of trumpets. Hmm. When was God's final wrath poured out on Egypt? The answer is it was not with the killing of the firstborns at Passover. That was not when uh, the children of Israel were rescued. It was immediately after the Jewish people fled, the Red Sea was parted, they went through the Red Sea, and then as soon as they exited out of the Red Sea, what? It closed and destroyed. Pharaoh and his armies. You see, God removed his people from Egypt first, and then he killed Pharaoh and his man, and it was all pretty much at the same time. So as that's the last person was leaving, the Egyptian, uh, correction, the, the, the children of Israel was uh, leaving uh, uh, the Red Sea and was on firm ground again. That's when God closed the waters and killed them. The, the Egyptians. So if we apply the, this Exodus principle to the book of Revelation, then the full wrath of God does not begin until when? The sounding of the seventh trumpet. Okay? And trust me, those first six trumpets, if you remember, they were pretty nasty. In fact, they were extremely nasty. And it's during the days, and the days here is a plural word of the seventh trumpet when God rescues his people, the resurrection and the rapture. Remember, at the sound of the trumpet, at the sound of the last trumpet, that's when the dead of Christ rise. And we who are still left alive are what? Caught up in the air to meet. So it's during those days, plural, uh, that ushers in also the seven bowls full of the wrath of God. When that seventh trumpet is being blown, uh, we have seven angels that are lined up to receive the seven bowls. So, having said that, let's go back and revisit the seventh trumpet real quick. Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, what? Very important. The kingdom of the world has what? Has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, his Messiah. And he shall reign forever and ever. So that is it. We're now the beginning of the, of the uh, millennial reign. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God and saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have what? You've taken your great power and have begun to reign. Now, does he have to clear house? Yes, he still has clearing house to go for. But this is the last mention of any trumpet being blown in Revelation. Has become, I mean, there's no more delay, um, Remember, the seventh trumpet starts the final cleansing 
uh, and as well as the gathering of the saints to Jesus Christ, where Jesus said he will send out his angels with what? With a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the seventh trumpet, it results in what? The rapid pouring of the seven bowls of God's full wrath. And that is what ushers in the kingdom of Yahweh and Yeshua. Okay? But also, unrepentant man during all this has made their position known, and the process of destroying who remains unrepentant now starts like the Red Sea destruction of Pharaoh and his army is also going to be the seven bowls of wrath in the Battle of Armageddon to destroy unrepentant mankind, the Antichrist, the, 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 the false prophet, and all of his armies. So, going on verse 18, the nations rage, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both great and small, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth, Satan's armies. And then God's temple in heaven was open, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple, and there was flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, earthquake, and heavy hail. Okay, so your wrath came, that's how it starts, that is Erkamai, and that is, once again, the present in imperfect tense, denoting a past action that's in progress, but still not yet complete. Now, after Jesus' wrath is complete, what? Then starts the judging, the rewarding, and the destroying the destroyers of the earth into the lake of fire, uh, which happens at the great white throne judgment. So what are my takeaways? <laughs> pre wrath uh, Pre-wrath or post-trib? What is it going to be, Dave? Um, let me just give you some thoughts. The resurrection and the rapture should be considered as one continuous event. Okay? It all happens practically simultaneously. Immediately one after the other. So the rapture does not happen until what? Until after the apostasy, the great falling away, the rebellion and the falling away, after the abomination of desolation, which is at a halfway point in the last uh, seven years of Daniel 77s, and after the great tribulation, and that is very clearly Satan's wrath, not God's wrath on mankind. In fact, God is using Satan to what? To distill and to refine both the church and the, the, uh, the Israelis, uh, the, the Hebrew people. Uh, and out of that, what, two-thirds are going to be a pe perish, and one-third will be taken out and refined once again. This means that the, the saints are going to go through the Great Tribulation, like it or not. I would love to have a, a, be to see a pre-trib, but I don't see it happening. When is this going to occur? It's going to occur at the last trumpet. That's what the Bible says. Noting that, the, however, that the last trumpet in Revelation is the seventh, and that is defined as the days, plural, of the seventh trumpet. So, where does it fit in there? God the Father definitely knows. That also means the dead in Christ and the living saints will meet Jesus Christ in the air. It's very clear, okay? In the air we meet Jesus Christ. Now, from there, uh, the resurrected and raptured saints, well, we could be taken back to heaven, to the throne room for a time. Uh, however, it's also probable that uh, we with redeemed bar, uh, bodies will be part of the army of heaven. Now, uh, do we uh, go to heaven first before we join the army? I don't know. Uh, Part of uh, two verses that would be interesting to uh, for you to explore would be Revelation 19.14 and compare that to Revelation 17.14. I'm not going to disclose that at the moment. Where Jesus destroys the Antichrist and his army at Armageddon. So uh, we may be part of that army. Uh, we may go straight into that army. We may go first to, uh, to the throne room of God. Um, that's unanswered in my mind. There will be multitudes of martyrs that will die beyond any shadow of a doubt. By the word of their testimony, it's going to be off with their heads. And Jesus very clearly stated and taught and emphasized and reemphasized that the one who endures to the end will be saved. And saved here 
It could be rescued. It could be preserved safe. It could be unharmed, at least spiritually. Uh, this could be uh, the Goshen Pinch principle, all or in part. I think maybe just in part, uh, and definitely followed by the rapture. There will be a rapture for those who are still left standing um, at the end of all this. So, my takeaway, Book of Revelation is ultimately a guidebook, right? It's a guidebook to prepare the saints of the church for end times, to prepare not only for ourselves, but also to prepare us to be a testimony uh, to others, to be a testimony standing up to us, to the Antichrist, I choose to serve God rather than you, and to evangelize those who are scared and are desperately searching for the truth. The Revelation is also a guidebook for what? Preparing the bride of Christ to be ready for his return and to give him, the bridegroom, all the glory. I'm not going to read it, but that goes hand in hand with the parable starting in Matthew 25 of the ten virgins, where there was five wise, five foolish, the wise what? They had oil with them in their jars, and the foolish did not. Um, and that could be a teaching for another time. So that's it. Um, that's as far as I'm going to take uh, my take on the rapture and the resurrection. So amen and amen. Um, I have... I'm pretty comfortable where I stand. The question is, how comfortable are you where you stand? At the end of the day, uh, each, each and every one of us, we need to be Berean. We need to search the scriptures. We need to base our beliefs and our conclusions, not on what somebody else says, uh, but what the scripture says, what the Holy Spirit says in the word of God. So we'll leave it at that. And, um, yep, amen and amen.